Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Head Injury Information Day. Um, I feel absolutely privileged to be speaking to so many of you today, so uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to be speaking about something that um, is very loaded, I think, in the um, media at the moment, AI. Um, it seems to be you know, coming at us um, to take our jobs or to um, you know, kidnap us in our self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of, I think, fears about it. Um, but on the flip side, um, we're also seeing headlines in the medical literature of um, AI assisting radiographers to identify tumors at a much greater level than uh, experts. And um, I think that uh, any new development will be as good as it is used. So what I'm going to be talking about today is can it maybe assist us when our cognition has been impacted by a brain injury or stroke. Um, just a little bit about me before I begin. Um, my name is Brian O'Neill, uh, and thank you, Guido, for the introduction. Um, <laughs> I am not a neurosurgeon, but neuropsychologist, and Guido and I worked together some years ago. Um, I'm an honorary senior clinical lecturer at Glasgow, and I work at the Active Care Group um, in uh, Murdiston, um, and I also work for the Rehab Group in Ireland, which actually makes me think that these are the second from last version of slides, but that's okay. No, this is the right slide. So here we have a kind of metaphor for navigating life. On the left here is a nice, um, it's a, a natural maze grown from box hedge in Melbourne, uh, in Victoria, in Australia. Um, and the maze has for many years been used as a kind of metaphor for life. You don't really know what's around the corner. If you come to an intersection and you know the maze, or you have a cognitive map of the maze, you can choose the right turn to find your way out, or find your way to the goal. Quite often in everyday life, the way to an objective is obscured by the hedges around us, by the fact that we don't quite know what we're doing, or we haven't the ability to access the memory of the last time we did this. So, when people have had a brain injury of any sort, in the acute period in rehab, I'm quite often amazed the number of times my colleagues, well, for the last 30 years, have been amazed the number of times my colleagues will say, he can if he's prompted to do it, but he can't without that prompt. Or she can get herself dressed as long as she's getting those prompts as to what's the next step. So we about, uh, it was 2007, um, a colleague, uh, Alex Gillespie, who's now at London School of Economics and I, we were mulling over this problem. I was working with people who'd had an amputation and were learning to use their artificial limb. They were mostly older adults. They mostly had a degree of cerebral dysvascularity and that's why um, that dysvascularity was the reason they lost their limb. And he said, what would you prescribe them to help them kind of get by in daily life. And I said flippantly, you know, um, a physiotherapist or a prosthetist that they could have by their side in the morning when they're trying to put on their leg so that basically they don't make any mistakes, the leg is on securely, and then they can get on with their daily life. And he just said, ah, but you know exactly what they should know and you know what the prosthetists and the physios know. And I said, well, we could ask them. And he said, well, if you could ask the prosthetists and the physios what are the steps, then we could instantiate that in an AI. I'm like, okay, what do you mean? So it was like the idea being that this branching tree shape guides the person from beginning this sequence to the end of the sequence, in theory, without making any errors. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that project in just a moment. But first, I'm going to talk about, I guess, the range of difficulties can, that can present after any kind of acquired brain injury. So um, a very kind of prominent Canadian psychologist called Donald Stuss has been working on this area for a long time, looking at what he calls executive function, what we as psychologists call executive function, which is 
the way in which we solve problems or um, get through activities in our everyday. We need to be able to, to, to I suppose, operate across these four levels of, of different um, mental functions that um, enable us to be problem solvers. Guido just mentioned the problem with the energization there, so that like sleeping too much and not being alert enough, not being conscious enough. We know that once you get started, you have to stay on track. And so that self-talk or self-instruction um, is uh, another of the factors that can be supported by prompting. Response to environmental feedback, um, so noticing when you've achieved your goal or noticing that that approach to a goal is not working and that you need to change tack. And then finally, my favorite uh, image, the Tunnock's Caramel Log. Um, I have this on all the time in that um, I'm not really a fan of this confectionery, but whenever I see one on offer on a plate of cookies in, in, a, in a meeting or whatever, I always eat one. Um, and, and I hope there's nobody from Tunnock's here, but always just slightly disappointed because cover on this thing is just so attractive. You just so want to have one. And then, anyway, they are pretty good, actually. Maybe I'm just getting into them over time. So what they've done there is they have made their product really salient. So I have an emotional response to it um, because of its shiny wrapper. Um, and then that helps, it, it upregulates its importance for me at that moment. OK. So those are all the areas that I think prompting can help with. Um, this is a bit of a, a background here. So uh, from 2007, myself and my colleague Alex came up with this uh, idea that maybe some technological support to talk us through problems might be effective. 2009, we started the work with the people with vascular dementia and showed in a case series of nine that it was effective and reduced safety critical errors to near zero. Um, 2013, we installed uh, an expensive um, piece of kit in someone's house to enable them to get home. It, it took them through their morning routine of getting up and showered and dressed independently. Then um, we did a randomized control trial. I would like to say that the majority of these studies were funded by the Chief Scientist Office of the Scottish Government, to whom we are very grateful. Um, anyway, to cut a very long story short, in or around 2017, um, myself and Alex and the developer on the project, David Conlusk from Web Garden, we basically said, let's shelve this. This is so complicated a problem. <laughs> so what we found was we could take any sequence in life, like donning a prosthesis, making an omelette, making um, a tuna mayonnaise sandwich, and we could work out by talking to experts what are the essential steps in that. And we could then instantiate that in an app. And then we could give it to someone. Now, the cost of doing all that was huge because the labor was so intensive. You know, interviewing experts, coding all of that, taking the text from the interviews and turning it into a, a, what we call a, a protocol for a sequence. So then along came artificial intelligence in the form of OpenAI's GPT models. So what is GPT? This generative pre-trained transformer. What OpenAI have done, and other, sorry, other AIs are available, but what OpenAI have done, I've looked into their model a bit more than others, they've taken huge corpus, huge corpus, corpuses, corpi, I know, what's the plural of corpus? They have huge bodies of information and then trained their model to try to predict what the next token would be in any one sentence. So they're treating these like bits of data, uh, these tokens, um, entirely without kind of the emotional loads that we have. So they're literally just trying to predict. And then the model is fine-tuned by feedback from humans. Now, somewhere along this line, maybe chapter GPT 3.5, maybe chat GPT 4, the model, the GPT, started to function as if it had common sense. 
Now, it was greeted as a great step forward in AI, um, but also, as I said earlier, expressions of fears for the end of the role of programmers amongst other professions. Now, I often think that there has a great sign a technological leap forward has been made is when people start fearing for their jobs. Um, Anybody know any buggy whip braiders? Or any hand loomers? Very few of them around anymore. Because mechanical looms came around and brought the industrial revolution. The automobile came along and nobody rode around in buggies anymore. So all the buggy whip braiders went out of work. But they started doing other things, you know? Uh, and I think the same is true. I, my programmer colleagues uh, tell me that they're not afraid of losing their job. They're just going to use ChatGPT to make their job easier. So anyway, can this common sense be harnessed to support us in solving everyday life problems? Um, and that's where you guys come in. I'm going to ask for, um, I'm going to try and do a live demo. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> but I need a, a, a common problem so we're not cheating. So can I have a, an everyday life problem from somebody who'd like to suggest one? My God, you're all so sorted. Nobody has any problems. <laughs> Pardon me? Missing a train. Okay. What would you like to do? Sorry, should we make it the, a really difficult one? It's the last train. Or. Okay. So basically, what comes up on this is the same as. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go over here. First, very, very briefly. So Smart Steps is the name of this AI um, iteration. Um, it is essentially um, taking the 17 years of previous experience to make the app function a little bit like a carer. Um, so based on what we've found works in terms of the way of delivering prompts and motivational statements and all of these things. Okay, so this is an example of ChatGPT which is the engine of this system, okay? Um, yeah, what I would say is that uh, this is free to use, and if you go to this website, you can download it on either an Android or a Apple-type device. Anyway, here we go. So, actually, I'm gonna take another couple of suggestions. We've got missing a train, and the life problem. Ran out of milk, nice one. And I heard uh, an earlier one earlier, we were talking to Chris, uh, something that happened to us both recently, we locked ourselves out of our houses. So uh, we've got a, a, a variety there, so here we go. So basically you would just open the app, tap on the mic. What would you like to do? I've missed the last train home. Bit of thinking time here. You can take a taxi or a bus home. If these options are not available, consider asking a friend for a ride or booking a hotel room for the night. Let me know when you're ready to continue. I have no money for a hotel room. You can ask a friend or a family member if you can stay with them for the night. I'm going to try another one. Um, so just stop that for a moment. So finding the app on your screen of apps is the main problem. What would you like to do? Um, I'd like to make a cup of tea, but I have no milk left in the house. You can still make tea without milk. First, fill the kettle with water and turn it on. Once the water is boiled, pour it into a cup with a tea bag. Let it steep for a few minutes, then remove the tea bag. You can add sugar or honey if you like. Let me know when you're ready to continue. Obviously, if your cognitive impairment is slowing your speed of processing, you can ask, can you say that again, but slowly? First, fill the kettle with water and turn it on. Once the water is boiled, pour it into a cup with a tea bag. 
Let it steep for a few minutes, then remove the tea bag. You can add sugar or honey if you like. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm going to do... I got my five minute prompt Next, just. Okay. if you'd like, add sugar or honey. Okay, so I'm going to do that last one, which was, um, yeah. What would you like to do? I'm locked out of the house. Please find a safe place to wait while you contact a trusted neighbor, family member, or locksmith who may have a spare key. Let me know when you're ready to continue. I think I remember that someone has a spare key. Please reach out to the person you believe has the spare key and ask them to assist you in entering the house. I can't remember exactly who. Try to recall any close friends, family members, or neighbors who you may have given a spare key to in the past. Okay, thanks. So, there is an example of some... Thanks. Well, hang on. Thank you. Shush, thank you. <laughs> So those were um, some examples, I guess, of uh, being talked through kind of common problems. Did we kind of decode those sequences and enter them into the device? No, we didn't. So um, that um, AI was trained with kind of enough human knowledge to know how to solve kind of those everyday problems. That's that common sense reasoning that it's capable of. Um, yeah, so where we're at with this is uh, we've re-engaged with our developers uh, who are called WebGarden, and they have um, said that the, the new model for the development of any of these things is that um, people will develop it and put money behind it if they can see users. Um, what we want to do is get it out there to as many people who've had a history of brain injury or stroke and have difficulties in their everyday lives as possible, and speaking to you guys here. Um, as I said, it's free and available to download at the moment. It probably will after yesterday's announcement that there is a chat GPT 4.0 or 4.0, I think it is, uh, that was released yesterday um, and made the news this morning. I heard that on my way in. I was like, oh, goodness, <laughs> what are the chances? So, yeah, there is, a, apparently it is, you saw there was a lag there in the kind of thinking time between my asking a question and giving a response. Apparently that's going to be five times shorter in this new version. Um, so yeah, uh, we think we have something that is useful, is usable. I've used it myself and frequently do, particularly if I'm doing something messy in the kitchen and don't want to have um, kind of, you know, marks on the phone or um, mess up a recipe book. I think the hands-free element of it is quite nice when you're trying to solve a problem. Um, now, I probably have gone a little bit quicker than I planned, so I'm happy to take questions at this point. Thank you, Brian. Um, questions? Oh, you had to pick the back. Hold on a second. Can you put in life circumstances to it? For example, if you don't have any family or friends nearby or other issues, can you put that to make it more directed to your personal circumstances? Thank you, that's a very good question. Yeah, so that if you go to um, the, um, yeah, if you, if you go to smartsteps.ai and you download a version, then it will let you tailor it to yourself. So that you can say, for example, I have a peanut allergy, and it will never suggest a ground nut in your recipe, and we'll just, it'll have that in there for, for good. Um, I have a, a, f a friend who, who trialed it once for me, and uh, he humorously said to it, like in that little bit of text, I need to be told twice. And so it gives him every prompt. You can put in there that you need it at a delivery rate of 90 words a minute if you speak like President Kennedy, or 
27 words a minute if you speak like Donald Trump. So, you know, there, there are ways you can tailor it to meet your needs. Um, yeah, um, let me see now, are there tailoring? That we've, yeah, so the, for example, the, the nature of your memory impairment. Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to do in, in an upcoming trial, so we've, sorry, I should say, we've only done one trial with this so far, a uh, single case in Galway, um, who is a lady who had her brain injury age 10 and has just never acquired the skills. She's now in her late 30s, has never acquired skills of independent cooking. And now she demonstrated that she could go from no ability to make an omelette to make an omelette like a boss in eight trials. So uh, she's great. Um, but anyway, yeah, and she's now using it for other things. But yeah, it's just one of those things where the, the, the trial we're kind of reticent to start, given that there's such churn and development happening in the AI space at the moment. But what we're hoping to do is imagine where you can anonymize your neuropsych report and then use that text to inform the, the system and then see um, can it deliver prompts that are really understandable by anyone given um, a certain set of strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. Hi, yeah. can it be tailored so that it can, can raise an alarm to an, an emergency contact? Yes. Um, so, um, yes, that is like so. In, in every of the other iterations that we've tried so far, this question has come up. So in, in going back through this, this history, it's like, what happens if the person gets to the end of the sequence and they haven't solved the problem? So the kind of calling of uh, an emergency contact or highlighting somebody. Now, that is kind of encroaching on what would be more like a service. Um, so that, um, but I... Yeah, actually, do you know what? It's, it's, it is configurable, yeah. So before, on the previous iterations, we always had to have a call a person to help kind of uh, a statement at the end of each thing if the person kind of runs out of options of, of solving the problem. So that one could be done automatically, yes. Thank you. Another question? We, we, just to say that we, it's not in the current iteration, but thank you very much for the suggestion. So I was just wondering, you were talking earlier about it being personalised for people. So what about people that are, have got speech difficulties? So it's hands-free, Brian, so can you, is there a, 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 somewhere that you can use it for someone that can't a, a articulate? <laughs> yes, yes. So um, the articulation thing has changed so much. So can I just, like, again, recap on this history here? So the device that we used in 2007, we had to train people to use Dragon Naturally Speaking, so that Dragon Naturally Speaking could ask a question that had a yes, no answer at the end, and then we trained it to recognize the difference between that. So people were asked questions, and then it talked them through it that way. This version, with the natural language processing, is actually really quite understanding of speech impairments. The lady that I spoke about in the Galway trial has marked dysarthria and a very strong Galway accent. Um, it took a little, so it was almost like a, it was like a conversation that started and in the first trial she had a few mishearings, there was a few mis miscomprehensions of the advice of her and vice versa. Um, but that pretty quickly kind of righted itself. She spoke a little clearer for it, but it learned to understand her. So there is learning going on, I think, in, in the way it's um, trying to pick up on what is, what is being said to it. But yeah, I, 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 see, I see the point that it will, I mean, it's not, going to, it's not a panacea, it's not going to apply to everyone. And if you have, you know, marked dysphasia, um, it might be able to pick out keywords and still work. I don't know. This is uh, an empirical question. Thank you. Is, any more questions? So this will be the last question before lunch. Can this take over from brain and mind? That does the sh scheduling. 
So, uh, thank you very much, good question. Um, so again, some of the people, some of the neuropsychologists, at so the first level before we invited um, people with a brain injury to try using this is we uh, invited neuropsychologists and other clinicians to try it out for us. Um, they said that scheduling would be nice because you can schedule with an Alexa and you can schedule with um, brain in hand and with new mind. So there's, it's almost like, I think with deference to the fact that there are existing platforms out there that do scheduling, we haven't tried to encroach on that space at the moment, although people have said, can you? Um, so it's almost, I see the difference between this as, um, so again, many years ago, Alex came up with this difference between macro prompting and micro prompting. So a macro prompt is like a, a ballistic throw in a reminder, you know, it's like, you've got a GP appointment at two today, you know. And then the micro-prompting is how to get from your house to the GP appointment. So what we've aimed to do is kind of just focus on that micro-prompting space of like talking people through the activities required to achieve a goal. And then the macro-prompting and scheduling, you can use your Alexa and use your new mind and use those. Um, now we have had like an initial conversation with new mind uh, who I think are, are a, a great up-and-coming startup. I don't know if people are familiar with them, but um, N-E-U-M-I-N-D, um, about maybe working together and incorporating this into their product. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, it, when in 2015 we, we talked about, in a book, you know, the prospect of coming artificial intelligence and using these like artificial intelligences to augment our cognitive function when that's being affected by a brain injury. You know, that book, we were so excited uh, when we wrote it, but now we're actually seeing these things coming on stream um, only nine years later. <laughs> We, we've not found an activity that it didn't have a solution to. So I had a toddler who was acting up and jumping around in a bath full of water, which I saw was a, um, there was a safety critical element to that. And so I, said, I just like had the app beside me and it was just like, what do you do with a toddler who's jumping around in a bath? <laughs> and it said, can they get down to the level of the toddler's eye line? Put your hands on its shoulders and say, making eye contact, I need you to get down into the bath, I need you to sit down in the bath. And it was like, that's really lovely, mellow parenting. <laughs> parenting better than I was at that moment in time. <laughs> but yeah, so we, we've not really found anything that we, we couldn't... I mean, um, yeah, one of my nefarious you know, friends, I gave it to and said, try it out. And they tried to like get a recipe for making a bomb or something. And it said, no, it's not going to help that. So the, there are guidelines in there as to ethical guidelines as to what it will and won't guide you through. So if it's safety critical for you or for someone else, it will not. Um, and that's uh, one of the promises of open AI that they are only, you know, it's almost like, you know, the, Google, there's some Google people, I think, involved in OpenAI, and uh, their kind of do-no-evil kind of uh, ethos is kind of coming to the fore. But yeah, I think um, that's a whole other question, is the ethics behind this and how that's being monitored, policed, and et cetera, because it is currently in the hands of the, the organizations that are producing these. Um, Yeah, so, so like one of these iterations that we did, we, we taught people with um, diabetes who'd lost the ability to sequence their own diabetes um, glucose self-checking. We taught them following the steps how to safely do their own diabetes and the blood glucose check. Um, so um, every now and then we do, like I have tried a couple of things of like asking about a, a medical problem or a constellation of symptoms and it will say it's not equipped to give medical advice um, to go and seek a professional. That's great, thank you. Could you please put your hands together for Brian and Neil? Thank you.